Good morning, everyone. Uh, this is Karthik Guja from uh, Mount Sinai, uh, New York. Uh, here we are for the Peripheral Life Case Series, monthly series. Uh, today, uh, we're going to have an interesting case from Dr. Krishnan and his team. Uh, we want to hear from you on uh, uh, peripheralinterventions.org. Please email or go on to peripheralinterventions.org and post your questions. We would love to hear questions from you. Uh, just as a reminder before we go on to the live case, we have our uh, June annual, um, annual symposium from, uh, from Mount Sinai. Uh, we would like everyone to go there and register for a uh, live symposium, and we would love to see you here live and uh, discuss and uh, um, have interesting questions from you guys. And uh, good morning again, and uh, we'll go to the room and uh, talk to Dr. Krishnan. Dr. Krishnan, good morning. Uh -huh. Hi, good morning, Karthik. I'd like to thank you for... Uh for coming and, and moderating today. Dr. Dang is, is on vacation. Uh, Dr. Wiley is, uh, is, uh, is on his way. So um, I wanted to thank you so much for coming and moderating. We have a very interesting case today to present. Before we get started, I wanted to introduce Ray Lascana, our interventional nurse practitioner, Shiny Matthew Kuti, our um, um, interventional fellow. We've got Elizabeth, our um, interventional nurse, as well as we've got uh, Ricardo, our um, interventional tech. Um, and Bhaskar Prashotam, our um, interventional fellow, endovascular fellow, is going to be presenting from uh, the control room with you. Uh, so um, we've got a very interesting case here. Um, I know last, last week we tried to, or last month, we tried to do a below knee case. Unfortunately, uh, very difficult uh, because we couldn't get pedal access. That patient ended up going to a fem tip bypass um, because we spoke with our surgeons. They felt that it was an adequate target vessel and that the patient will do well. Interestingly, one month follow-up on that patient, the patient has undergone a transmet and it's healing well. Uh, the fem tip bypass is open as we speak and, and, and he's doing fine. So that's the one thing about that, just a little follow-up on that patient. Lo siento, señor. Dolor aquí? Okay, one second, guys. So he's having a little bit of pain. We'll just take a picture just to make sure. So uh, while I'm just taking a picture here, I'm just going to have um, 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 our, our fellow, Bosker, uh, go ahead and uh, take a present the case. Bosker, you ready? Yeah, ready. Morning. So we have a 53-year-old male uh, with known uh, peripheral arterial disease who presents with critical limb ischemia. He's got rest pain with early gangrenous changes involving the right big toe. Uh, as mentioned earlier, he's had a left ATPTA for his uh, PAD few weeks to months ago. He's known on? to have coronary artery disease with a recent PCI to the LAD. He's got ischemic uh, cardiomyopathy with a systolic uh, uh, heart failure with a rejection fraction less than 25%, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, and diabetes. He was an ex-smoker, otherwise his social history was uh, not significant. His medications uh, were aspirin, Plavix, Coreg, uh, Valsartan, Lipitor, Insulin, Pantoprazole, and Zoloft. So uh, his vital signs uh, this morning was uh, blood pressure is 150 or 80, and the rest of them were uh, pretty stable. So significantly, in his physical examination, uh, his right DP is faintly dopplerable. His PT is dopplerable. His right big toe has got these early gangrenous changes, as well as his right foot shows uh, signs of chronic ischemia, you know, with uh, uh, hair loss and the skin being uh, uh, shiny, so therefore uh, indicative of uh, uh, kind of chronic critical limb ischemia. Yeah, you want to take it from here, PK, kind of go over the angiograms with them? Absolutely. So, so as you can see here, we have a, another guy with critical limb ischemia. Our practice has become a lot of critical limb ischemia as we speak. So well, I wanted to, we wanted to demonstrate some of the um, nuances of CLI. And obviously in CLI, your technical success rate may also uh, decrease as well. So, so in, in this particular case, this is a very interesting patient. He's a patient who has um, a, a history of CLI. And I wanted to show you the angiogram. So this is the initial angiogram of the common femoral system. You can see that the superficial femoral artery is patent. The, uh, the uh, uh, proximal common femoral is also angiographically normal. Uh, next, the next one, you'll see that the superficial femoral artery, are you having, is he having pain, guys? The, I think he's having a lot of pain. The superficial femoral artery in the adductor canal uh, is also patent. Next. The popliteal artery is also patent. And you can see distally, he only has single vessel runoff to the foot. Ricky, ask him where his pain is. Is it the thigh or the, or the toe? The, uh, I can't see. So he has, he has single vessel runoff to, uh, to, uh, to his foot via the uh, perineal artery with a diseased posterior tibial. And then, and, then, and then the anterior tibial artery, where is it? From the hip all the way down, the whole thing? Okay. 
So, so the, uh, you can see here that the anterior tibial artery also is occluded and it, and it reconstitutes distally with the posterior tibial artery also coming. So you can see he's a diabetic with typical um, um, uh, you know, infrapopliteal disease. However, as we know, diabetics, that's really a misnomer. They actually tend to have um, um, you know, multi-level disease more, more than just infrapopliteal disease. So at, at, this, at this time, what, what we wanted to really do is spend, spend a little time with you talking about what are the different approaches to these kind of lesions and, and what we can do. So the first thing that's important is a complete diagnostic angiogram for you to see where, you know, what, what, are the, what are the vessels and what's your approach going to be. I think for all of us out there, I think what we need to do is plan the case and modify the case um, as we go along based on what's occurring clinically uh, with, with our patient. So you can see here that this particular patient, uh, you know, he has, he has, you can see just by angiographically, he has good uh, access sites in both the tibial um, in the dorsalis pedis, and then go next, please. Go minus, I mean, or, or plus, I think it's plus. Yeah, any good idea. So you can see here also the entry into, into the anterior tibial artery is also, he has a nice nub. Nice nub. So, so this patient actually is, is, is very good for both a, a retrograde and an and a, and a anterograde nice. approach, uh, either way you want. Second, you have to think about, well, what, what are the challenges that you're going to face with this patient? Well, the first challenge is, is a long segment CTO. Second challenge is obviously the, the fact that he is he's a diabetic with calcified disease. Thir third challenge is going to be uh, visualization because he has some chronic renal in insufficiency issues. So your plan has to be is what is your, your first mode of therapy and what is your second mode of therapy? What, meaning, what are my goals? So my first goal, and the ideal goal here, would be to revascularize the entire dorsalis pedis all the way into the toe. Why? Well, first and foremost, it, 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 uh, it, uh, it matches the angiosomal uh, uh, correlation of, of the area of ischemia, which is the great toe. So if, if you believe in angiosomes and if you believe in direct revascularization, well, this is clearly going to be the direct revascularization if you can get the entire DP open. Indirect revascularization, if I fail that, I also have the option to open up the posterior tibial, which has multifocal stenosis. So this way, with, with the arch that was patent, as you saw in your diagnostic angiogram, you can also achieve indirect revascularization via the posterior tibial. For so class. I do have my bailouts here in the sense that I know I have two choices of what I'd like to do. Ideally speaking, I think what we need to do is to go ahead and do both. I think that's the most important thing. So, Christian, I think that was an excellent uh, um, explanation and I think overall uh, view of how what we're going to achieve and what we're going to do. Um, before, we, before we go ahead, I uh, just want to introduce, we have Dr. Wiley here, uh, our guest moderator today, who joined us. Um, and uh, he has a question for you, Dr. Krishnan. Yes, Dr. Wiley. Yes, so uh, your approach is going to be what? Antigrade... Uh, uh, intervention, or are you going to do a retrograde uh, intervention? You're going to try to cross from above, or are you going to cross from below? Well, you know, you know, Dr. Wiley, I, I think I, you know, at, at the, the stage we look at, that's what we were talking about. You, you clearly have two, two, uh, two types of uh, what is it called approaches here. I, I, I think in this particular case, what I'm planning on doing is to go from above, and if I fail. Uh, as compared to the last time, which, which we know that the, uh, the artery was not favorable, if you go to the foot, foot pictures here, you clearly have a dorsalis pedis that I do not have to stick at the surgical landing zone. You can see that the dorsalis pedis in front of the, the posterior, uh, excuse me, in front of the tibia, I have a long neck dorsalis pedis that allows me to stick in that particular area above where they would necessarily tie their revascularization. Now, so therefore, would, 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 would you have considered then an anti grade stick? Uh, uh, rather than a, a retrograde uh, uh, stick or? Uh, well, you know, I mean, you definitely, anti-grade approach may, may, may be good as well in, in order for us to do it. But uh, I, I think at this stage, you know, I think either or is fine. Okay. Okay. We're just a little worried. He's having a little thigh pain. I'm wondering whether we perfed that vessel on the way down. It looks like we did. You see that, Dr. Yeah, Wiley? I, I, see, I see a small perf right in the yep, mid-thigh, right, right at the 20 level. Yeah, so I think, I think we're going to have to go coil this first. So this is going to turn into an interesting case. So, so give me um, a, a, a vert tip catheter, please. This is a nice demonstration of what are some of the things that can happen in these kind of cases. So he's having a little bit of pain, as I told you, and while we were getting ready. You know, Prakash, you may do a, a prolonged balloon inflation there and, and perhaps not need to coil. Hopefully 
so that will be all you need. So that's well, you know, it's FSM not, it's not, you know, let me take a picture and see. The question is, should we just, should we continue with intervention since it's such a small perf, come back and take care of it? Or how would you guys think I should do this? So if, he, if he's, con I think you can take a picture again, uh, uh, PK, and then uh, you can watch for a little while. I think we can continue with the intervention. Okay, let's do that. Um, I think right so. I think, I think it's a very small perf. I, I think agree. in the thigh, it's okay. going to seal. I, I know you're on heparin, if I'm not wrong. No, we're on Angiomax here. You're on Angiomax here. Okay, since, so. it, since it's a live case, you're on Angiomax. And that's very important, I think, for everybody at home. Because, you know, I noticed immediately because the guy was having a little bit of discomfort in terms of, in terms of he was resting comfortably and suddenly he started to move. When, when we went down with the wire and got into a little branch, we pushed, uh, trying, to, trying to get things ready, obviously. But the point is, you know, we do that all the time. It's all very unlikely that it was going to perf. Yeah. But clearly when he started getting a little uncomfortable, I wanted to watch. So right now what I've asked Elizabeth to do is just turn off the Andromax. We'll, we'll take a look whether that just seals off on its own. That's right. Um, but with his real insufficiency, I think it's such a small perf, like you said, yeah. we're not too worried. So let yeah. me tell you my plan. So what, what, what we normally do is go with a fielder and a fine cross the, or any sort of support catheter. It doesn't have to be a fine cross. We happen to use a lot of these in the coronary, so that's what I decided to go with. I have now gone and gone ahead and gotten selective into the anterior tibial artery. And what I'm going to do is go ahead and wire this slowly. So you can see here that the, it, the important thing to remember is there's going to be occlusions and there's going to be what, what we call as lack of filling. So here, clearly this artery has some, some amount of occlusion in it and also some amount of lack of filling. Yeah. So I, I think that, it, that you need a profusion pressure to be able to really visualize the artery very well. Right. So what I'm doing here is just advancing the, the, the catheter, taking this out, and I'm going to go with our workhorse wire. And, and uh, let me just tell you what we talk about. We have a very nice talk on wires that we put together yesterday, myself and Dr. Bosco, who did the majority of the heavy lifting. And, and I can tell you that uh, what, what, what we're going to do here is we're going to present to you uh, our approach. And this is the fielder? Yeah. Sorry. Oh, that's, that's what I needed. So that's you know what, what Prakash? Uh, uh, while yeah. you're getting all this done, I think you should do an angiogram and see if that uh, perf is still ongoing. I think that uh, with an ongoing perforation, whether small, medium, that's large, good. however you want to call it, that has to be taken care of before okay. you continue. Let's take a look. I agree with you. Let's go. Let's take a look. You know what, guys? Let's, let's listen to Dr. Wiley. I agree with him. Give me a vert tip catheter. Let's do this first because we can show this in two minutes. Give me a vert tip catheter. This is also interesting on how to, how to fix these things and, and take care of these things. So, uh, Bosker, while I go and do this diagnostic stuff, why don't you go ahead and talk about uh, what, uh, what your, uh, your talk that we prepared. Thank you, Dr. Krishnan. So, as Dr. Krishnan mentioned, uh, today we're going to talk about guide-wise. You know, as basic and uh, I can't hear uh, common as it sounds, uh, I think this is... This is probably one of the most uh, neglected uh, aspects of uh, uh, interventional cardiology, meaning that we take it pretty much granted. So uh, what's the purpose of a guide wire? So A, you need to access the lesion. B, you need to cross the lesion. C, it forms a platform to delivery the, uh, of the devices. And finally, for safety. So, you know, whenever you speak to... Anybody from the engineering side, you're going to hear so many terminologies like the length, diameter, penetrability, torqueability, shaft support, shaft flexibility, visibility, so on and so forth. So when you look at this, it seems a little daunting and confusing. So what we've done is uh, uh, we're going to try and compress this such that it make it clinically relevant. So first we're going to start with some of the basic guide wire components. So some of the slides I would like to thank uh, Dr. Craig Walker. So when you look at a, a basic guide wire, it has a core which forms the, you know, the main stem of the guide wire which runs all the way from the proximal to the distal end and it then tapers and forms different sizes. So it has the core diameter, the core material, then it has the tapers and then the grinds. And then it has different coatings and covers and coils and finally the tip. And the tip can be different styles and we're going to go over them. So the six key components of a guide wire, this is with regards to its engineering, is the core material, the core diameter, the core taper, tip design, the coils and covers, and finally the coatings. <clears throat> so let's start with the core material. So the core material is the one which really gives you the flexibility, the support, the steering, and tracking. You know, the earlier ones, the traditional ones, have always been stainless steel, which really provides you a great coronal support, and then you have the nitinol. 
which has a phenomenal memory, meaning it won't kink, and it's very flexible. And nowadays, you have the hybrid version where you have a bit of stainless steel to give you the colonoscopy port, and the more distal end of the wire, which uh, will be nitinol, so it retains its shape. So here's an example. Say, for example, you cross the lesion. Uh, you have the nitinol wire, which still maintains its shape. So you can still deliver the device over this, and this is what you had planned initially. But the stainless steel, on the other hand, uh, unfortunately changes shape, and uh, you might have to switch it out to a different wire if you want to continue the procedure. So the core diameter. So you look at the, uh, the equation right in the middle. So strength is equal to the fourth power of the radius. So therefore, larger the diameter, greater the rail support, and greater the torque transmission. Torque transmission is when you wiggle your wire or you turn it in different directions, uh, it is what transmits in the distal end. So pretty much you almost have a one-to-one -one if you have a large diameter. And smaller the diameter is better the flexibility and better the tractability. Uh, so as the equation says, you know, strength is equal to the fourth part of radius. Therefore, small changes in diameter can mean a significant changes in its performance. Next comes the core taper and grinds. So core taper is defined as that part of the wire where the diameter of the core changes over a set distance as reflected in the schematic picture below. And core grind is that part of the core with a constant diameter. Now let's try to see how is this clinically relevant. So there are two kinds of cores. Uh, you have uh, the tapered core and the parabolic core. And if you look at the graph down below, you have on the x-axis the position, meaning the uh, distal end of the wire where the tapering happens. And on the y-axis, you have the bending stiffness. So if you take a parabolic core, the transition is really smooth and you have a linear kind of uh, taper down. While using a tapered core, it has a stepwise pattern. So clinically, say for example, you're crossing a tortuous lesion, you have a more predictable behavior of the wire with a parabolic core. But with a tapered core, you have to be careful because of the sudden changes or the drastic changes in the stiffness, you can have a slightly unpredictable behavior. Now looking at uh, the different kinds of uh, core tapers, meaning broad and short. So the broader the taper core, or longer or gradual it is, it's preferable to use these wires to get across tortuous and acute bends, while opposed to abrupt or short tapers, as the uh, cartoon reflects, that the initial soft part does go into the acute vessel, but then when the, the stiffer end of the wire comes in, then it tends to prolapse. So therefore, you have to switch uh, different wires based on what kind of uh, vessels uh, you're going to enter into. <clears throat> now, the next thing to understand is, for example, this graph. On the left-hand side is, or rather the y-axis has the stiffness, and the x-axis has the distance from the guide wire tip. So when you look at this graph, it essentially tells you what the stiffness is at different parts of the wire as you get away from the tip. So for example, in this one, with different tapers, right about at 18 or 20 centimeters from the tip, you kind of have a constant level of stiffness. So the clinical relevance is, if you want to deliver devices, you ideally want it to be over the stiff part of the wire. So you at least want close to 20 centimeters distal from the lesion. And this way you can know how deep to position your wire. You really don't have to go very deep. And also it will tell you that uh, if you can't go deep and if the flimsy part of the wire is in the lesion, then you probably have to pick a different kind of wire. Next comes the tip design. <clears throat> so the tip design is what kind of determines the steering and the durability. So there are two kinds, the quarter tip and the shipping, shaping ribbon. Sorry, shaping ribbon. The quarter tip is essentially the core goes all the way to the distal end. While the shaping ribbon, the core goes almost till the distal end, but then stops short of it. And then you have this ribbon with another wire sticking inside it. So what's the difference? So with a quarter tip, is usually very, very good to use in peripheral vessels. The simple reason being we go up and across, so there's a longer distance we traverse, and therefore you need better steerability, 
And also, most importantly, you need that tactile feedback, especially when you're crossing, crossing CTOs, you want to have that feedback. Unlike that, what you see in the shaping ribbon, it provides more a flimsy or a flexibility as well as uh, it tends to prolapse more easily and you don't get so much a tactile feedback because you have this cushioning between the distal end of the core and the shaping ribbon. <coughs> Next comes the penetration power. I think this is very important when you're picking up uh, wires for uh, crossing CTOs. So the penetration power equation is defined as the tip stiffness over the area of the guide wire tip. So uh, as you can remember from your physics equation, uh, that the pressure or the force exerted is the amount of uh, force you generate over, or rather the thrust is equal to the force generated over a given area. So therefore, if you have a very, very stiff wire, and if the area of the guide wire is very, very small, you're able to generate a significant amount of penetration power. Now, how do they test it in the industry? So, uh, essentially, you have this chamber on the left-hand side as the uh, schematic uh, diagram represents. You have the wire which goes into the cell, and then it starts to measure how much it deflects as uh, represented in red. So, when you push the wire down and get a 10 millimeter gap, you want to see how much load is required to deflect the wire by two millimeters. And that's what gives your grams. So you, as you can see uh, the, uh, the graph on the right hand side, that this wire needs a four gram load to create a two millimeter deflection. And this is what is the basis for the different uh, grams in your, <coughs> in your wire. So next comes the uh, stiffness at different points. Now the reason I put this up is because I've seen some uh, people cut guide wise and they sometimes use this to penetrate lesions even though this is not really advisable. And the physics for this is simply because the further you get away from the uh, guide wire, depending on what kind it is, your stiffness increases and therefore your force or penetrability increases. Next comes coils and covers. So these affect the support, the steering, trackability and visibility. Now, as you can see, some of these are repetition, like the steering, tracking, and visibility. The reason being, there is multiple engineering components involved in uh, these performance characteristics. I think when we are trying to learn about this, it's important to learn what engineering aspects affects them more predominantly than the other one. It also affects the dimension of the wire. And finally, I think in this part, the most important would be, how does it affect your tactile feedback? So you have different kinds, the outer coils, then you have just only the tip having coils. Then you also have different permutation combinations where you have coils covered with polymers and you have polymers covered with some coils. So let's speak about coils. So coils actually is, creates the guide wire tip to be highly deformable. It helps maintain a constant overall wire diameter. It helps maintaining rigidity in the rotational axis. It provides friction from corrugated surfaces. Therefore, you get a better tactile feedback. And finally, uh, you know, it helps in uh, visibility. So guide wire covers is, is essentially, you can think of it like a jacket or a sleeve around the wire tip. It can be a polymer or a plastic, and it provides lubricity. It provides smooth tracking through torsuosity, and it is different from hydrophilic coating. Next comes hydro, sorry, the guide wire coatings. The two standard ones are hydrophobic coatings and hydrophilic coatings. So hydrophobic are the ones which repel water, so it creates a very smooth wax-like surface and therefore you can pass devices very easily. You don't really need activation from water. It reduces friction and as mentioned earlier, it helps with device trackability. Next comes hydrophilic coatings. This minimizes friction and provides better device or guide wire trackability. Because it attracts water, it creates a slippery like gel-like surface. It's just like when you start to ice skate on you know, ice, the amount of slipperiness created with that, it's very similar to this. So when you look at the two concepts of lubricity and tactile feedback, so on the y-axis, your lubricity, on the x-axis, is your tactile feedback. Now, as you go closer towards the left-hand side, which means uh, a polymer cover with hydrophilic coating, your lubricity increases but your tactile feedback starts to drop because remember, it creates a very slippery surface. And that's why you would hear from people saying when you're using hydrophilic wires, you gotta be careful because you can enter into plaques, you can dissect, and you won't realize sometimes. 
And as you move away from it and move to the right-hand side, you know, your lubricity reduces, but your tactile feedback increases tremendously. So as mentioned earlier, you have different combinations, uh, so kind of to suit for different kinds of lesions. And uh, coils is the ones which really makes the wire kind of radio opaque to some extent. The platinum is the most radio opaque, and stainless steel is the least later opaque. And it's obviously the material and the density of the material which causes this. So essentially, the performance characteristics is what is listed on the left-hand side. On the right-hand side is your design modification, which we went over. I won't go over this in detail, but this is what uh, kind of correlates with each other. Uh, so these would be the key factors to look uh, in the engineering designs on the right-hand side. So this way we can uh, pick out the specific performance characteristics we want and look for that specific engineering uh, modification. So, you know, we went over a whole bunch of performance characteristics, different kinds of uh, engineering concepts. It seems a little daunting and confusing. So what they've done is you can break them into four different kind of work costs, uh, sorry, four different kinds of wires, the frontline work cost wire, the frontline axis, extra support, and the speciality. This is something which we have derived uh, from using uh, coronary CTOs. So the different features uh, which results in different performance characteristics and therefore the clinical relevance. So therefore the core diameter and material is responsible for torque transmission, therefore helps in uh, the technique for advancing and crossing. Then comes the inner diameter with the tip stiffness and lesion crossing safety, coatings, covers, and sleeves with lubricity and lesion crossing ability. Then you have the core diameter and the taper length, which helps you with the taper, sorry, with the support, and therefore with device deliverability and pushability. The material is responsible for the durability, the shaft support, and flexibility, and therefore with your wire durability, technique, and device delivery. Uh, and then the rest of it is self-explanatory. And finally, the core tip dimensions, uh, which helps you with your lubricity versus safety, and therefore with your penetrating power and lesion crossing ability. <clears throat> so some of the uh, uh, guide wire tip shapes you got to make depending on what kind of lesions. So if you're trying to penetrate a CT, you obviously want to have a straight or a very small angle at the very distal tip. And now when you're trying to navigate the tortuosity, you want to have a small angle at the distal tip and a subtle secondary bend. And finally, when you're re-entering the true lumen uh, from the subintima, it's good to have an acute angle almost like a J-tip. So this is another excellent slide I borrowed from Dr. Walker. This is, uh, you know, when your wire fails to cross, you got to troubleshoot. So what's happening? So for example, the wire prolapses at the cap. It tells you that you need a wire which needs a higher gram you know, uh, load at the tip, or you need a sharp, short angle. Next, if the proximal segment of the tip buckles, then you either get a wire which has a higher penetrating power, or you get a hydrophilic coating so the wire can negotiate through the occlusion, and definitely you need to use a support catheter. Next, if the wire is able to penetrate through the lesion, but then it fails to follow through, it tells you that you need a greater rail support or a lower profile, which means you increase the penetrating power. And finally, it's good to use a hydrophilic because this way the wire can slip through. And finally, when the, when the wire crosses through, we've often seen that the device is unable to cross. I mean, what we can do with the wire is either you can switch it out to a higher rail support or a lower profile system so it's easy for the device to track and also preferably use a hydrophobic one. So some of the roadmap to success is always keep switching wires, meaning go off with wire escalation. Change the wires to suit the different kinds of lesions. Shape the tip accordingly. Always, always use a support catheter. This gives you a lot of support. And you've got to use a different wire to penetrate a cap as opposed to navigating the actual lesion or for device delivery. And finally, depending on where your axis is, this is going to determine your push, your torqueability, your reachability, and the support it provides. So therefore, I want to conclude by saying that it's important to understand the engineering to help pick the right wire. 
and then you have to troubleshoot. So under fluoroscopy, you got to see how your wire behaves with how it's responding to your movements. And finally, to, it's important to be familiar with multiple wires and their key attributes. And in this presentation, I did not list any specific wires because I think it's good to go kind of unbiased and try to see what features we need in a wire and then pick the wire accordingly. Otherwise, if I start spelling out names, then we kind of already have a biased opinion about it. At the end of the day, you've got to pick the right man for the right job, and doing so, you tend to save money. Thank you, Dr. Krishnan. Well, thank you very much, Bhaskar. That couldn't have been a better presentation. So I don't know if you were watching what we were doing. We stopped because we were just balloon inflating. Let me show you C minus. So he started having a little bit of discomfort in the thigh, and Dr. Wiley wanted us to take a look what that thing is right. So what we did was we went in with a go minus. We, we went in with a, a curved catheter, advanced the wire into, into, that, into that branch. Next, please. Then we went ahead and tracked a uh, O1A trailblazer and took a selective shot. It's a very, very tiny perforation. So, so initially we thought, okay, well, let's, let's go ahead and, uh, and coil this. And then we said to ourselves, why don't we just balloon tamponade it conservatively for five minutes while Dr. Bosker is giving his, his, uh, his talk, and then we can go ahead and do this. So I don't know what we're going to do. I might not even balloon tamponade it, even if it continues to bleed, because I think this will stop. Uh, it'll tamponade itself off. Um, but however, what I want to do is just watch him. The patient now has absolutely no pain in his thigh. But this is an important illustration of what an 014 wire can do in an SFA while you're trying to get down if you get, it, if you get into this. So how are you going to manage this? Say this becomes a tibial artery, this becomes any artery in the body that you need to coil. Well, generally what you want to do is you want to take a selective picture of the artery that you want to coil. You want to put this catheter in or, or any catheter that's going to fit the size of coil that you want. You know that coil comes in multiple different sizes. They have, they have detached coils. They have coils that you can actually detach and release whatever it may be. In general, in this kind of artery, we go with an 018 8 coil, which we use in the coronaries. And generally, what you want to do is to, to selectively intubate the artery of interest with a catheter that has the diameter for you to deliver the coil. Then after this, what we do is we go ahead and put a stiff wire in, into this, in the, well, that's how you get into the vessel. Once you're in the vessel, you push the coil into that catheter, and you advance the coil by pushing a wire. As the coil is advancing, you need to have somebody to give you forward tension on this particular catheter because as the wire in the catheter comes out, it tends to kick, uh, excuse me, as the wire in the coil comes out, it tends to kick out the catheter. So the last thing you want is to lose the catheter into the vessel, into the SFA, or into the parent vessel. So right now at this stage, we're not going to do anything because he's asymptomatic, and I think we can conservatively watch this and even could coil this at the end of the case. At this stage right now, we're just watching with a, with a six millimeter balloon that's been inflated, and our, our time is around 10 minute balloon inflation. So right now we're at seven minutes, and, and it, I think it was an important part of, uh, of what we talked about when you're doing CTOs below the knee, that you should know how to coil these types of vessels. So remember, that the key points are identify the vessel early. And look, look, in this particular case, while I was talking to you, the patient started to move. I knew that the wire got into a vessel as we came down, and I thought it was kind of odd why he was moving. Now I know why. I mean, obviously he has other reasons to move, but I know that he had issues in the thigh, and you saw this little leak. Now, this, this should tampen out off itself, or with the balloon occlusion, it should close. The important thing is, go next, please. Once we balloon occluded it, we took a picture. Next, please. And you can see in this position, next please, you can see in this position, you have, you have a little bit of filling of the, of, of the branch, you'll see. As, as the die comes down, hits the balloon, you can see the branch will start to fill right there. Right there, you start to see it. There it goes, there it goes, there it goes. Next please. So we pulled the balloon back, went up again, and then we took another picture. And now you'll see that there is no filling of, the, of this particular vessel. So therefore, I think, I think that we've got, it, we've got it occluded off, and we're going to wait another minute, then we'll drop the balloon, and then we'll go ahead. I uh, suspect that the bleeding is going to stop. I agree. I think it's going to stop, so, too. But 10 minutes is a good, good enough time to do this as well. PK, this is, 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 is mid-thigh level, highly muscular uh, area uh, for a perp. I think even if we don't do anything at the end of the case, I think it would have just sealed by itself. I think it's a very, very tiny perp, probably because of the hydrophilic nature of the wires we use. Oh, absolutely, Karthik. Absolutely. I, but I think it's a nice uh, moment to take time to talk to our, our, our colleagues about this. Down, please. So we're going we're gonna to go forward with the case. 
I just wanted you to think about what are your wires of choice in these type of cases for you guys. So I think uh, I, I think Vasco's presentation was yes, absolutely sir. wonderful uh, to have a general idea of exactly what kind of wires to use, why to use. Um, as we always do it in uh, Sinai, I think uh, we've always been believing in uh, um, wire escalation method. So if, if I uh, was there, I would probably Field. start with um, a hydrophilic wire, oh. like a fielder wire, okay. and try to see, you mean the um, the work is um, as you said, uh, it's lack of filling in the HE. So I think there are some areas of subtotal occlusion, some areas of total occlusion. So use a fielder, see if it goes. If it doesn't go, then escalate it to Confianza wire. So you can see here, Karthik, what we did here was after the balloon occlusion, uh, and again, you see, uh, I mean, you want to be prudent because as you can see, there's no reason to deploy a coil if you don't. Right. So you see now it's completely sealed. Right. So now what we're going to do is we're just going to go and complete our intervention as planned. But the recognition part of it is what I want our audience to understand is that you do need to recognize when your, when your patient was comfortably lying down, uh, or as Pink Floyd said, comfortably numb, uh, what happens is, you know, you, you, you have to, uh, you know, understand that there may be a, a, a reason other than say, God forbid, you touch that ulcer or you, or you, or you probe that, uh, uh, you know, the ulcer inadvertently with your hand. So right now, we're just going to go down and get this case done. Uh, but I agree with you. Our, our process, as you know, we work together for a couple of years now. What we generally do is we go with a hydrophilic wire, we probe it, uh, and, and, uh, and, and then we go ahead and do a, uh, a, uh, a stiffer wire. Wire escalation, uh, Dr. Wiley, for you, what does that mean, Dr. Wiley? Yeah, it's exactly what uh, Dr. Baskar uh, explained in this uh, highly scientific and physics-oriented uh, talk. Uh, one starting with a hydrophilic wire, as uh, it has been mentioned, then going with a stiffer wire with a higher gram load, and uh, so, so hopefully so been able to cross so the, uh, the proximal cap, which usually is the stiffest uh, portion of the... Uh, so, Dr. Wally, my, my, my question to you and Dr. Karthik is, what is the... Uh, now, you have, you have ample coronary wires, right? So, so when do you guys use 014 wires? When do you guys use 018 wires, so on and so forth? Give me the, uh, the other Usually one, Usually you want to start with uh, 014 wires uh, all the time, uh, right? Because that's what we normally do. We try 014 wires as like we do it in coronaries. Um, 018 wires, I think if, we, if the lesions are very calcified and you think you need more uh, support, and of course, uh, more than talkability, more support to penetrate the cap. I think uh, 018 wires are used. I think below knee, 018 wires have... Uh, uh, much less uh, uh, use than 014 wires. I think most of the 014 wires should be able to cross below knee vessels because they're pretty much the same size as coronary. So, Dr. Wally, what percentage do you use 018 wires in your practice in below knee intervention? Less than 1%, hardly ever. Hardly ever. Uh, 035, I think there's no role for them below the, the knee, even though some folks would use them. I think if you ever have to consider that, then you should consider a different strategy such as uh, surgical bypass. Well, but why do you say that? Why do you say if you have to use 018, then you're gonna go for surgical bypass? I don't get that. Yeah, so um, I, I don't think that the uh, 035 wires are defined to be used in nope. vessels that measure perhaps uh, two millimeters is the same uh, uh, concept of trying to use an 035 wire in a coronary. Uh, <coughs> I think that uh, it's a dangerous wire and you could cause more harm than more. good. Little very more. easy to dissect, very more. easy to create a larger New perforation guys. in an intrapopotial vessel, got it. which will complicate the yeah, case let go, let go, let go. Uh, to a, 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 a form that is not reasonable. Okay, now give me a compliment. I, I, I agree with uh, um, Dr. Wiley, uh, PK. The problem is uh, using um, 018 and 035 wires is a perforation vessel. Uh, there's so much collateralization uh, below infra, in intrapopotial vessels that if you perf something uh, with all the anticoagulation and everything, you're just making things more complicated. And, you know, so, I, I so, so the question then becomes is, so if, if you go 01, 01 in a CLI patient, you have 014, you, you, you go to your 018. If you go to an 018, what's your 018 wire of choice? Normally we use, uh, I, would, I would prefer to use V18. Um, we can, V18 wire has a good, I think, as a, I, I, I mean, I named the wire, but in general, uh, you want to use any wire with higher talkability and higher stiffness. You want a good tip load. That's what you want in, this, in the CTOs. Um, I mean, 
the, the talkability at, in CTOs might not make much right, of a difference. Right, ACT. If you think it's very calcified, I think you can go right, anti-grade and take care of the talkability portion. But uh, I think having a higher tip load is the most important thing. Okay, so, so you can see here, Dr. Wiley, we got into that proximal portion. I have my scout film on the side for, for me to know how far the vessel was patent, and it was approximately patent up to here. So now uh, we, had the, we had the bivalve rooting off, so now we're going to go ahead and try to wire this. And you can see here that it's uh, not really... Are you using a hydrophilic you wire, or what type of wire are you using? I'm going, I'm going for... Can I have a new glove, please? I'm going for a, uh, uh, what is it called, a confianza, uh, a uh, non-hydrophilic wire, a, penetra a wire with a high penetration tip, and try to work here. You might say, why? I, I, I think the, the, the hydrophilic wire might have worked, and we might actually go back to it, but I think there's a very calcified tip right there that uh, we need to deal with. I know you don't like to talk about names of what wires, but uh, uh, the audience sometimes would like to be in tune with... Uh, uh, some of the ones that you use, even though other choices are appropriate as well. So you started with what, with a fielder wire and then escalated to a confianza? What did you do? I want you guys to see this. Angiographically, it's not filling at all, but you can see here, look at the way the wire moves. It this is, like it's a this is not a total occlusion. It's like a subtotal occlusion. This is a subtotal occlusion. Ah, it there was the cap. There, right? So I actually felt it pop in that one spot when I went through. Now you can see, ah, well, here it's a little different. Here it's moving a little, little weird. Right there is an issue, too. So you can see there's areas of occlusion, and, and, uh, and, and see the right here is occluded again. So let me just work here a little bit. It's a typical uh, long I don't know segment infrapopliteal occlusion, uh, right. PK. So well, we have a little bit of a calcium right there deflecting right. us. So I'm going to go ahead and, and I'm going to add Bosker. The key thing here for the audience is you want to know how the anterior tibial artery runs, right? So, uh, so therefore, you really want to follow the, the channel that you think that the anterior tibial artery runs, especially in case of no roadmap, especially in cases where, where you, have, you have renal issues. Right here, I'm having a little bit of resistance. There it goes, right through that. But again, yeah. you can see the wire is not the, moving the as... Is, the wire tip is not very Not as there. robust here. Right. I agree. So therefore, it we're going to... It looks like it's going in a sub spot right there. It might be, absolutely. So I'm going to put my torquer on here. A little bit better. Not as good here. Show me down, guys. I think you may be going subentimal there. I agree, Dr. Wiley. No question. Give me a road map here, guys. Might be worthwhile to do a road map. Ready to inject? Oh, I'm okay. There it is. I think it's uh, so you can see it is occluded in this area, and that's why we're having a little bit of difficulty. So this is the area where you want to use your roadmap. You want to get your catheter really close. So what I did was, now as I pull back, there's a lot of resistance on my catheter, as you can see, as the wire just comes flying back. So that means I'm going to have to really push the catheter very. Very. Would you would you wire it into that segment where the filling is happening, and then push the catheter down? Because if you push the catheter down, you might create a channel. And if you are really sub uh you think uh, it might give you a trouble because the wire seems to go a little bit away from the main vessel. There's no question, Karthik. I agree with you there. But I think here the, 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 the resistance is really in pushing the catheter, not really the wire. So I think the catheter, we're definitely sub up here, I think. There is, there is my catheter. Good. Now my catheter made it down a little bit. So now I'm going to try. No te mueva, senor. Senor, no mueva. You are moving. There it is. Yeah, there it is. Right now we're go. through. Oh, okay, into that branch. Into the branch. Now we know you're not so good. <laughs> <laughs> so that's a good point. That oh, what what now is another occlusion right here. Right there. See another occlusion. So let me get into this area. Wow. It is tight. There is no question. That's okay. nice. That's a, that's a branch.
Dr. Krishna, how often do you use an O3-5 wire below the knee? I have actually never in my career used an O3-5 wire below my knee. Okay. There you go. Again, you're into the vessel. I think... Uh, I haven't okay. used one either. Have you? Uh, no, Project? I have never used an O3-5 wire. Actually, I've never used an O18 wire. <laughs> uh, I mean, I have probably used once or twice, but most yeah, of the times the O4 Liz? wires actually take care of the... Well, you use them with I would do whatever you need to do. Yeah, we, we have used it yeah. in coronaries, so I think that's where, uh, that's where the we advantage take a picture? I mean, we can cross a a smaller yeah, vessels. These are much bigger vessels when compared to coronaries, so... I use O18 from uh, yeah, cool. trivial axis. Yes, yeah? we do, definitely. Especially when you have uh, below knee access, I think uh, over knee have give you more support. Andrea? You're right there, it's good. So we, we're getting good blood back. We just want to take a picture. 90 DSA, guys. Just want to take a picture and, uh, and uh, just to show you guys what we're going to do. So you can see here we've gotten through, and, uh, and now we're just going to take a quick picture just with a little 2cc injection. So you can see there's our, our vessel. We're in the true lumen. So now I'm going to put a Grand Slam wire down. Make this roadmap, guys. I'm going to put a Grand Slam wire down. And my question now is the meat of the procedure. I mean, I know we got a little distracted with, with, the, with, the, with that questionable perforation. The, uh, the issue is now how do you guys treat these lesions? So this is a guy with, with impending gangrene. He's got, a, he's got an ulcer uh, at the level of the great toe. Um, he has, uh, Dr. Wally, since you're not here for that, the diagnostic angiogram, he has a patent posterior tibial, albeit with multiple areas of stenosis. Uh, he has a, uh, a, a, a patent uh, perineal with areas of uh, disease, and he's got this long segment occluded AT, which we just crossed. So the question is, what is your algorithm in when you treat these patients now? What would you like to do, off roadmap? Well, I, no. uh, I like to use the uh, angio zone concept, as you alluded uh, earlier in, in the presentation, uh, is the, uh, the uh, first toe uh, ulceration, so the anterior tibialis, which is what you're intervening now, I think is the appropriate choice. So what's uh, your modality? What, do, what is your favorite thing, or what do you think works best? What are your goals of your intervention that you do in these cases? So, I mean, the traditional approach, and uh, that, that's the one I uh, continue to follow, is to ensure straight line flow to the area of, uh, of uh, so give me a, ending um, a threat. Yourself. Yourself. For at least uh, three months, that would be with a prolonged balloon inflation, perhaps. Uh, you just want to have at least uh, three months of uh, flow for that lesion to heal. Now, that doesn't mean that, that you're going to have restenosis, but by that time, hopefully you may have some collateral circulation that would prevent that from occurring again. Of course, in diabetics, it's a lot harder, but it's still the remaining uh, uh, best approach, in my opinion. So, uh, so, so in terms of, so you would just do a balloon and leave it with a balloon? Would you do any other modality? Or, I mean, you could do atherectomy. You could do bal uh, prolonged balloon inflation. Below the knee, as you well know, uh, restenosis is very high regardless of what approach you, you use. Uh, there's uh, some smaller studies that have looked at the drug eluding uh, balloon, and they have failed. Uh, stenting is a very, very long uh, area in a small caliber that vessel, which restenosis is going to be high as well. So I think, in my op opinion, atherectomy or prolonged balloon, balloon inflation would be the way to go as of today. I don't know, Carter, Car Car what's I, your take I, on? I think, let me look at the other side of the coin, because Dr. Wiley is saying prolonged. I think uh, I strongly believe in uh, um, atherectomy below knee. Um, I think the, the basal trial uh, looked at it. I think the registry trials for the, um, the directional uh, atherectomy looked at it. The ex uh, the the trials for eczema trial, which looked at uh, below knee uh, vessels, I think the patency rates with atherectomy and prolonged balloon inflation are pretty good. Uh, okay. Especially uh, well. if you're looking at a small area of ulceration, I think just temporary uh, restoration of blood flow might be enough. But if you're looking at something like gangrene or extensive uh, skin, um, skin involvement and large area of necrosis, I think... You need more than six months, uh, PK. Uh, what do you think? I think the, with the wound care, with all the debridement and everything, you might need extensive, probably at least an year of uh, patency. And I think atherectomy and prolonged balloon gives, uh, gives that kind of patency. Braille the wire, please. Um, I'm, I, I, I know drug eluding balloons lower. have failed below knee, but I think, it'll be, uh, I think it'll be very futuristic to look at atherectomy and drug eluding balloons uh, below That's the knee. It the dart therapy below the knee and look at it. Keep, keep, keep what do attention. you think, PK? Well, you know, it's interesting. I, you know, I, 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 oh, okay, I, I, I bent the wire. Show me above. 
So, you know, I personally believe this is good. Let's go up here. So I personally believe that patency um, is, is, is vital uh, to, in order to promote wound healing. The question is, uh, you know, why do you do atherectomy and why do you do balloon? We know that the below knee vessels recoil tremendously. So especially these CTO occlusions you know, are going are, are gonna to recoil no matter what that you do. There was an elegant paper in circulation that came out a little while ago that they actually did an, an angioplasty followed by actual um, um, angiographic uh, evaluation in QCA or QVA of the vessel after a certain time period. And they found that there was inevitably 40 to 50% recoil of these vessels that occurred. So, so I think the reason to do atherectomy or another modality is to try to help uh, reduce the recall. So we know that the, in, in Shamus's paper with atherectomy, albeit it was the FEMPOP region, it, it clearly showed that it reduced uh, bailout stenting rates because of dissection, but it also reduced stenting rates because of recoil. So I think here, the, my, my logic of atherectomizing this vessel is to go ahead and prevent the recoil that I know is going to occur. So right now, we can ask me, well, why are you ballooning you, Prakash? Because I know the atherectomy catheter is not going to pass. Uh, we had a lot of trouble getting the quick cross, and our fellow Shiny was, uh, was smart enough to point that out, where, where we initially thought we should go with the atherectomy catheter, but because the fine cross didn't go, we know it's not going to cross. It's kind of the same thing in the coronaries, where, you know, if the fine cross doesn't cross, then you need to do some sort of um, atherectomy that's rotational or, or the, uh, the diamondback atherectomy, but you need something. So here, our, our idea is to balloon this, to give enough room for, for, for us to go ahead and get the atherectomy catheter down. So when we balloon it, our technique is going to be a prolonged balloon inflation with a 1.5 balloon, just enough to get the atherectomy down there for about two to three minutes, and then we'll go ahead and pass the atherectomy down. Because so that's, that's the logic of atherectomy for me. I don't, th I don't think it matters whether you use CSI, whether you use laser, whether you use Silverhawk, whether you use, uh, whether you use uh, Pathway. I think that the atherectomy or any other modification that you use should be something that you're comfortable using. You understand the nuances of the devices. You understand the limitations and, and the positives of the device so that you can actually be successful in revascularizing these patients. Prakash, uh, I think that uh, one of the things that has to be clear uh, when you choose a, pro a prolonged balloon inflation or you're going to use uh, atherectomy is two things. One. And uh, you had done an elegant uh, uh, study where you showed th that um, uh, adventitial cuts with atherectomy increase uh, the risk of restenosis uh, by, I think, it was four or five folds. So it's, it's, it's truly very significant. Yeah. And I know that that uh, paper uh, shortly will be uh, uh, published. Uh, number two is the fact that atherectomy, regardless of which device you use, has the risk of a microembolization which is something that you always have to take into consideration. If you feel comfortable with, with that, then sure. Uh, there's no reason why you cannot use uh, atherectomy, but that's something that you still have to, to uh, consider when you choose what device you're going to use or what approach. Yeah, I, I think those are great points. I mean, I, we, we know that here, you know, again, the reason for atherectomy, in my opinion, is not to prevent uh, the re -snosis. I think that they're all going to re -snose. If you look at uh, If you look at definitive LE, uh, you know, uh, I know it's a, it's a large registry, uh, CEC adjudicated, core lab and core lab adjudicated, and there was also a, a good safety monitoring board with that. You know, the complication with atherectomy is quite low. The rates of dislabelization occur, uh, but I think with good technique, you can clearly, uh, you know, reduce that. So, so I think that, uh, you know, and also why you're using uh, atherectomy is, again, like I said, I think you're having um, um, a, a lot of recoil that you can actually help uh, reduce using atherectomy. But your points are well taken, and that goes back to my point when we talked about knowing the nuances of the device, knowing the limitations of the device, knowing your experience with the device, and then deciding. So, Walk Prakash, if you're using directional atherectomy down. below the, the knee, how many cuts do you... Do you uh, well, generally, you generally, do? Jose, it's, it, that's a great yeah. question, Los Santos, Senor. Generally, uh, uh, that's a great question, but generally we do about two cuts, but how we do it, we're very conservative. We do one cut first. We do one cut first, followed by the second cut. So, PK, as you said, you know, uh, you had difficulty passing the fine cross through. Um, I understand the directional atherectomy catheter might not pass. Uh, yes, I mean, the nose cone might pass. We might have some difficulty, but you think other... Uh, other atherectomy catheters like laser also will have a problem going through? I think laser would go through without an issue. Right. Uh, and we talked about that. I think that also 
Other catheters that may, may, may go through are, are there are plan I mean, CSI will go through without an issue. Right. But, you know, so, I mean, it just depends on what your, your comfort level is. That's all it is. I think that we, we do a lot of directional atherectomy. Again, uh, our, our reasons for doing directional atherectomy depend on the area and the vascular bed which we're treating. In this particular area, my reason to do directional atherectomy is to reduce the, the recoil that occurs and, 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 uh, and improve my balloon angioplasty results, which I have data showing uh, you know, uh, that, that it does do that. Right. So therefore, I'm pretty happy with that. You know, I think that CSI will result in a balloon, and we know CSI also results in lower balloon inflation pressures, et cetera, et cetera. So you have a lot of data out there to support the use of atherectomy in these cases. So I think, I think, I think if, if, if you could do prolonged balloon inflation, I do not think that's wrong. I think that if you get a great balloon result and you want to stop, I think that's phenomenal. I think that's okay because our goal here is to heal the wound. So I think whatever, whatever the way you're going to heal that wound, that's fine with me, and that's fine with most, uh, most good operators. Chris, do, do you have a lesion at the uh, end of that, uh, the tip of the wire, or, or you just uh, have there? I, you know, Jose, I didn't, I didn't mess with it too much yet. I just want to open up the CTO first okay. and then take a picture, and then maybe we'll, we'll decide how to manage that at the very end. So based right? on the initial pictures, PK, it looked like as if uh, the docilis pedis also had some... Uh, subtotal occlusion, right? Right. We will, after we, do, after we open up the anterior tibial, completely, we'll definitely take a look. Sure. Can I, I have a rail, can I have a rail, please? We're waiting on uh, Dr. Krishnan um, loading the directional atherectomy catheter. Um, I think that's what he's doing. Um, just this wanted to remind everybody, the registration is now open right for uh, the summer complex uh, coronary vascular and structural case symposium. Can I have a dry uh, Which will be held from June 17th to 19th. Uh, please uh, go online, uh, register at uh, cccsymposium.org, uh, um, uh, and there's a registration link right there for you guys. And also, um, this video will be bro broadcasted uh, later on ah, um, in it's the week up. Um, in the peripheralinterventions.org website. Uh, we have been posting all the other uh, educational talks, um, like the last week's talk, uh, la um, last month's talk off, of off. Uh, infrapopliteal um, disease intervention uh, by Dr. Uh, Bhaskar Purushottam uh, is being posted on peripheralinterventions.org. Now uh, you, you can, can see what's it. happened here, Karthik. Right. So, so now we, we're trying to push the atherectomy catheter down. And you're having a... And, you're, you're and, and the catheter is now prolapsed into the aorta. Right. So how would you guys handle this? Well. So I think, uh, Piki, at this point of time, you have to carefully, uh, I, think, uh, I think, give a nice rail and uh, carefully bring it down. Dr. I Wiley, I agree. That's all you can do. You gotta that's pull, all you can do. You, you got to pull back the. Uh, you have to pull the back the whole system catheter. together. Pull back yeah. the atherectomy, torque the catheter, and oh. I think slowly land it in. Well, I think this is going to be next to impossible. Let's say. Oh, I think it would. So I think happen. it might. Uh, you have you have a talkability on your uh, directional atherectomy catheter. I think if you torque it, well, it might I be able to help I don't you. know if I can torque it that much. I can tell you that. Now what's happening here is the figure eight is worrying me. Yeah, so it's basically locked into the uh, into the thing. So there, there you is. go. That was not fun. I know. <laughs> and then uh, I think you might want to check yeah. your wire position. <laughs> PK. Well, I'm not. Sheet. I'm not worried about my wire position. Yeah. I'm worried about my aorta. I think the, the aorta is, will, is okay. I think it should be fine. This is a. This is a. Uh, if if I'm not wrong, this is a infrapopliteal vessel. Real? It's a smaller caliber uh, uh, directional atherectomy catheter, right, PK? It is. So the amount of, uh, I mean, the amount of pressure and the torque it's, it's going to do on the iliacs is going to be much less. Well, it's it's very interesting. Like this case is like teaching us everything we should not do. You know, it's it's it's, it's very interesting and it's fun. It's fun when these things happen. Well, and it does happen, so the audience needs to know how to handle it. Right. So yeah. I'm pretty happy that at least we were able to show it. Now we lost wire position. But we should be able to wire it. I think a lot of the times they think once you cross the infrapopliteal CTO, the job is done. But uh, actually, I think the case probably begins after we cross. So, nope. so I'm going to have to rewire this. You had done already a prolonged balloon inflation, right? Prakash? Yeah, I did do a balloon inflation, yes. Okay, so we may inject a little down and see... see um, I think probably we should wire it under uh, the fluorophage. Yep. You know? We're going to do we're we're have just gonna, a lot of uh, dissections. Well, what we're, we're going to do is we're going to go with a fine cross and then rewire it. And, you know, that's an important uh, thing that happened because you can see 
when you push, as we were pushing the fine cross and we were pushing uh, the balloon, obviously the catheter migrated up. And when we were pushing the atherectomy device, it, probably, it, 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 it migrated up even further. That's right. But it's important to recognize that, and then you can see how we were able to bring it back. Yes, it's scary with the little twist of the aorta, but generally speaking, as long as you recognize it, you're able to you take care of it, and you're able to do it very, very quickly. So now uh, the point is our aortic pressure is good. Everything is good. We're just going to go down with this balloon, rewire this, and then we're going to go ahead and do the atherectomy. The question is we have restarted the Angiomax once we know that the perf is done, right? We have restarted it, yes. Okay. Give me a field of wire here, guys. I think that's where you had the difficulty initially going in. Yep, that's the. Uh, that's why I don't want to go with the grand yeah. slam. Give me a torque, guys. Are you going to do a roadmap or floor fade or? Well, you know, you got a lot of uh, issues with creatinine. And his EF is also low, so. The field of wire can be your best friend. Yep. That's where the occlusion is. Okay. okay, let me have the the, the confidence again. I mean the grand slam. And get the atherectomy catheter again. Okay, just as a reminder, the next live case uh, is scheduled for April 22nd. Uh, um, again, if you guys have any questions, please uh, email us at info at peripheralinterventions.org and we would um, love to answer your questions. Dr. Christian, uh, even though he's busy doing the complex case, he'll, he will definitely, I'm pretty sure, have uh, time to answer your questions. Uh, it's a pleasure to answer any questions. But So, so far you've seen the, uh, uh, the fact that you can get a side perf. You need to recognize that. You saw that the catheter can kick back with these up and over below D cases. That's part of the advantage of what Dr. Wiley was talking about, doing anti-grade approaches where you have a lot of pushability without, without having to worry about the sheath. So I think, I think we're okay with all this. I think now we're going to be flushed out the atherectomy catheter, and now we're going forward, and we'll make a pass right now. Yeah, you need to come on the other side. Just Actually, you know what, Ray, let me just feel it. I mean, let me see how much resistance I have. So, Dr. Guja, uh, Dr. Wally, any other forms of atherectomy that you would do here other than directional? So, if you're having a lot of resistance with this uh, directional atherectomy catheter, I think, I think it's not a bad idea to consider a uh, laser. It's a, it's a little lower profile, and I think easy to pass. So, it might, uh, it might not be a bad idea to do it here. Yeah, particularly, if you would have had trouble trying to get a balloon uh, down into yeah. that, that vessel, a uh, 0.9 laser uh, would have... Uh, made it a little easier. Yeah. Well, you saw we were pushing quite hard. Yeah. yeah. I think, as you said, any atherectomy catheter can be used here. Um, it depends on what's, uh, what, a, Show me a what is guys. the person who's operating uh, good with. Right here is fine. A little, little higher? Higher. Yep, this is good. No, to Christian, I'm anxious to see a picture. Oh, I agree. I got it. So you want to go where there's no bias on, please? And then very slowly advance forward. The question I know, um, um, I know we always go um, uh, anti grade, but we do always crossover method. But have you have you ever preferred Off. doing anti grade uh, sticks for uh, below uh, the intervention? Oh, uh, we have we've done it when we have done it many uh, often. Uh, Karthik, you know we're not a big anti grade lab. Off. The reason why why we don't do anti grade much is on. We're, we're pretty proficient at crossing up and over like this and getting it done uh, for patient comfort as well as our comfort. Off. On. But is there, any, is, is, is there any point where you actually prefer um, an anti-grade versus a, a crossover method? At, at any time would you choose anti-grade particularly for a baloney intervention? Ready, DSA? Show me long. Oh, well, yeah, if you have a very tortuous iliac, that may higher. be an, uh, an appropriate uh, approach. Higher. Even though, it's, you know, right with here. a braided sheath, Jack. usually it's not, not a problem. But there's always a case that you run into difficulties in very tortuous calcified uh, iliacs. Okay. 
So now we're getting some flow. All right, very good. We're going to work one more pass. It's actually pretty good. One more pass, guys. Let's clean this out. Show, show me the foot, please, Flora. So, Dr. Wiley, if you see a long calcified lesion in the infrapopliteal, like the nature of the lesion, and you think that you need more, and you know you're going to push harder with the catheter. That's okay. Uh, the spine cross catheter or atherectomy catheter, and you know it's going to prolapse yeah, like it happened in this case. Would you prefer anti-grade from the beginning itself? Unless you can do it quickly. If you think the lesion is very calcified, long segment? Oh. If perhaps, you know, um, most of the times we were able to manipulate uh, the devices even though it is calcified, but that may be an appropriate uh, uh, consideration because you need more pushability. Right. Uh, in this case, it really did not look that calcified to me. I thought that the up and over uh, approach that uh, Prakash had done was, was appropriate. I think the problem here was uh, when the catheter was being pushed. Uh, the sheet and, already went back. Yeah, exactly. It was already go going back. So when you push a device and it doesn't move, what's happening is that the sheath is going backwards. Right. We don't need to flush all this. So I think uh, we have to always remember, right, uh, whenever you, you're pushing something and the, the, the catheter right. or the balloon is not going forward, you should always go back and look at your sheath in, the, in the bifurcation. Uh, and that happens to all, all of us, yeah. Yes. So we're, now we're clean, we're clean, we clean the device. Now we're going to go through with another pass. And then, and then the plan is going to do to a prolonged 2025 balloon. Can you please pull the wire? Yes, thank you. Yeah, and in the proximal area, you, you may one. probably use a 2.5 uh, a or a, even a 3.0 balloon. balloon. Yeah, absolutely. Pull, please. Even distal, distally, it looks like a 2.5 vessel, uh, yeah, BK. So it's pretty big. even 3.0 might not be a bad <laughs> idea to use approximately. Well, I, I think what we just need to do is just be conservative and choose our, our weapons conservatively. Right now with atherectomy, we have a, a nice result, and, and we're going to continue to do that. Uh, and we'll see, we'll see how this looks after the second pass. Show so me Dr. Above. Wiley, I know the Belloni uh, drug eluding balloon um, research from uh, Europe. Right all it. the European trials have not shown benefit, but you think it has any, uh, any role over the next okay, we're on the right side on. You know, I think so. I think it's, uh, there's, there's smaller trials. I think we, we have to do more, more research in that uh, arena. Um, but uh, I don't see why it works Off. in the... Uh, SFA uh, and in the popliteal and not in the infrapopliteal of a vessel. So it could be techniques that, uh, that may be having an issue. So I'm still very optimistic that drug eluding technology is going to be uh, the way to off. go below the, the knee. I agree. Um, I think with the, with the, and the cost, cost is also an issue again. Uh, but I think with the, with over time, the costs uh, will make up for the, uh, off. I think for the interventions. On. But if you use atherectomy along with the, the, the wire. And Belloni, instead of yeah. just plain uh, balloon, I think Off. that might be very beneficial. Yeah, I think on. so too. So we await more uh, research Off. in that area. And I think there's some studies, l larger studies that are being done in Germany, if I recall correctly. L 48 mag DSA. So we made two passes. So now we're going to take another picture, and then we're going to go up with that balloon higher, guys. Okay, right there. Good. Ready? Inject. So now you can see the dorsal anterior tibial is filling as bristly as the other vessels right there. So now we're going to go with the two o to actually give me a two five three o guys. Yeah. So now you have straight line flow. Now you have straight line so this flow. This is a like very good re result. So far, I think uh, you know with all the craziness that went on with the first two things with the perforation and then this, I think we're we're working pretty good here. Now you can see the posterior tibial there is also severely diseased, but the idea would be to be able to get this nicely with this particular balloon. I mean, with this particular device, and then be done with it. So right now, uh, we, we've not gone into the foot, as Dr. Guja suggested. And what we're going to do is just balloon this with a prolonged balloon. The question, a question, um, would you, uh, I know this is a big toe um, gangrene, and I think AT will take care of this, uh, the big toe gangrene healing. But in general, if you have uh, extensive necrosis, uh, would you ever consider doing a, a multi-vessel intervention? You know, that's so funny. You know, Dr. Graziani, who comes to our course, um, you know, Dr. Graziani believes in, in, uh, in, uh, in what, he's, what he calls as global revascularization, in especially the diabetic foot. Uh, if, for those of you who are going to come to our course, you're going to see uh, a lot of different cases, a lot of different theories on, on how to fix this. I think that in the diabetic foot, with the absence of a good pedal arch, 
I think you have to think about global revascularization, you know, in these lesions. I see it. I know okay. the plantar Stop. reconstruction method has taken a, a big uh, swift in the peripheral, uh, peripheral side. Um, I think a lot of people are started believing in plantar reconstruction, so that's why I was Well, you know, I think, I think Dr. Wiley, I mind yourself go up, are, are, are a little conservative, just go to nominal slowly, in the sense that we don't use pedal access slowly, yep, go, what's nominal, guys, 10, right? So slowly. Uh, so we don't use pedal access unless we really fail anti-grade access. Show me above, please. Right. So, so, you know, I think a lot of people are doing a lot more pedal access very quickly, and I think, yes, experienced operators can clearly do it, but I think that what you need to do is use pedal access judiciously when, uh, when, when, you're, when you're talking about uh, doing these lesions. I think that judicious use of the pedal access will, will clearly help you to, uh, to, uh, uh, to, uh, to achieve uh, success. But I think with uh, anti -grade, good anti-grade techniques, preserving that, that pedal uh, app, you know, access site uh, for future interventions, bypasses, whatever it may be, also, also will, will, is very important. So I think, I think what we wanted to demonstrate today, I mean, we demonstrated a lot of things today, but what we wanted to demonstrate today is really talk to you about the, me the method of anti-grade cross. And if you think about the method of anti-grade cross, it could be either, e either anti-grade access, it could be you know, up and over access. The, the second thing is, is understanding the anatomy when you take these pictures. You want to see, okay, am I going to go for direct revascularization and follow the angiosome technique, or am I going to go for indirect revascularization? And, if, and is there an intact pedal arch? So, so when, when you decide that technique, any great technique, you have multiple crossing catheters, which we didn't go over, because I think nine out of 10 cases can successfully be, lead, be crossed with a wire and, and a support catheter. So generally speaking, you need to understand that these occlusions are really, part of them are occluded, some of them are totally occluded and very difficult. Some of them are partially occluded along the way and have areas of what we call of lack of filling. And, and so therefore, go with the hydrophilic wire first. When you go with the hydrophilic wire and you're able to cross with a nice support catheter, you watch the movements of the wire. If the wire is moving very, very freely, then you know you're within the lumen and you can be aggressively advancing your support catheter. You saw Dr. Guja talked about the wires stopped moving, and Dr. Wiley pointed out that they were worried that we may be subindimal. We were concerned with the dye, and we stopped immediately. When, when, when we saw that, we switched to a, a CTO wire and were able to penetrate the distal cap and get through. Once you get through the distal cap, we talked about the merits of angioplasty. First, the goals of therapy. The goals of therapy is wound healing or limit the amputation. So, so when, when you look at the merits of, of, of what, what interventional devices we have, all of them can basically achieve the goal as long as we have good wound healing and good follow-up care. So, so down. So, so, so therefore, what you want to do is go ahead and do the next thing, which is go, go forward and do whatever therapy it is that you're going to need to do to open the vessel. You can do balloon angioplasty. You can do atherectomy with balloon angioplasty. You can do spot stenting if you need to because this is a CLI case, and the idea is to get straight line flow into the foot. The merits of balloon angioplasty are cheap, fast, easy, and, uh, and, and, and does work. The, uh, the problems are recoil, flow-limiting dissection, so on and so forth. The merits of atherectomy with balloon is, 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 is the fact that, that it helps uh, re reduce the, the pressures that you're going to need to open these vessels and also re reduce the recoil uh, that, that these vessels may cause after, after just plain old balloon angioplasty. As far as the mechanism, of the method of atherectomy, I think it's whatever atherectomy that you're comfortable with and the status of the distal runoff. Dr. Wiley clearly pointed out that dependent on the distal runoff, uh, you may you want, you watch out for, 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 wait, you didn't balloon you the didn't proximal part. I mean, are you guys sleeping? So anyway, so, 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 so the point is, so, so the point is you, you want to be able to use the mechanism of, uh, of atherectomy dependent on what you're comfortable with. So, so right now, let me get back involved in this case. Go ahead, Carl. I think you uh, create any, any comments. Uh, so I, I com that, was, that was wonderful, Dr. Show me higher. Mean, that's <laughs> if higher I was in the audience, that, that's, a, that's a complete, little bit low. I think, overview of what exactly we should do oh, in stop right interventions. Stop A little back. Uh, and I um, can't agree with you more. Um, well, these cases look uh, right pretty simple, but uh, they're very time-consuming, and I think... Uh, well, so far, I mean, we, we didn't have those hiccups. Right. We're an hour and 20 minutes into our case. I mean, you figure we spent at least 20, 20 minutes with those hiccups, well, you know, with the sheath, with the fiddling around, because while Bhaskar was doing his presentation, our plan was to work right. and then show the final result at one hour. So clearly here, what we've done is we've gone ahead and, and now we're doing another balloon uh, inflation for, for another three minutes at this spot right here. Now, Christian, I know you, you talk about it every single time. Doing an intervention is one step, but 
again as a follow up for the wound healing and everything is another step um, nobody knows better than you about wound healing uh, would you would you suggest to the audience of what exactly you do after you do the intervention where does the patient go how do well, you well well i think that's a great point i think as interventional cardiologists especially i think the vascular surgeons who watch are 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 are, are very good at wound healing Interventional cardiologists have to work with a wound healing specialist unless you're going to become one yourself, which is, again, um, a labor of love. You really have to enjoy uh, you know, taking care of these wounds, following these patients closely. We have a wonderful wound healing clinic here at Mount Sinai. We work very closely with our vascular surgeons and our podiatric colleagues. So these patients are going to need very, very close follow-up. It's interesting. We had a fellows course just last week, and one of the fellows asked us about that. And I think, I think it varies depending on your practice. In our practice here, we basically send send the patient to the wound healing clinic. We follow them up either bi-weekly or monthly. There are interventional cardiologists in, 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 the, uh, in the fellows course who told us that they see the patient weekly after, assess the wound, and decide when to intervene. So I think it's, it's dependent on how, how uh, much you trust your, your, your wound healing colleagues uh, to let you know. We, we get a lot of referrals from them, uh, the podiatrists as well as the, the wound healing center. So therefore, you know, we're able to talk with them freely. So I think that's, that's probably the way, the way to do it. Dr. Wiley, what do you do? Well, I agree. Uh, I think that it's critical to have a relationship Down. with uh, the uh, wound healing specialist, whether they're a podiatrist, whether they are uh, plastic surgeons, or whether they are uh, vascular sur uh, surgeons. Uh, whoever is going to be to have that level of expertise, I think we should have a relationship with them, unless you feel comfortable uh, with uh, wound healing uh, management. Dr. Uh, Karthik, what do you do? Um, I do the same thing, Dr. Wiley. I, I'm not specialized in uh, wound healing. I, I would love to learn wound healing, but uh, uh, I guess at this point of time, it's, uh, it's, I think it's better to work with a vascular surgeon. Um, I have a vascular surgeon and uh, a podiatrist who's very good at wound healing. That's whom I use, and I think uh, they do a wonderful job. I and think that the point you made is very good, Dr. Gujo, because I think interventional cardiologists are very good at opening these arteries and not very good at healing them because we don't follow them and know how to uh, take care of the wounds. So I think it's important what Dr. Wiley's point is to f formulate a team which includes a vascular surgeon, interventional cardiologist, radiologist, and or uh, a, a podiatrist. I think this is very, very important. So I think that whether it's private practice or academic practice, this part of it is incredibly important. Yeah, I, I think I, we can call it the vascular team. I think that's what it should be for the, all the CLI patients. They should be a good vascular team. Everybody has Sydney. a role in it. So let's see the, this picture here. Yep. We injected. I did. I just injected. Okay, there it is. All that's right. That's beautiful. All right, so that's you have uh, AT flow faster. So than AT is else. faster than everything else. Show me above, guys. Laura, he's sitting. There it is, beautiful. So we'll, you know, I mean, that's a pretty good picture right there. There seems yeah. to be a little bit of recoil, recoil in the middle. In the mid we'll, we're gonna, we'll clean that up offline. Um, I really want to thank all of you for hanging in there for an hour and a half with us. You know, he's getting a little cramped. We'll take care of that. And uh, I, I want to thank Bosco for the wonderful presentation. He worked incredibly hard uh, on that wire presentation. And I'd like to thank Dr. Walker for sharing some of his slides with us in that presentation. Uh, Elizabeth and Ricky, um, our fellow Shiny, as well as, as well as Ray, and uh, thank you so much. I'd like to really extend an invite to all the fellows, as well as all the attendings, because we have the, uh, the, the, the our live symposium um, June 17th and 18th here at Mount Sinai. Our fellows course is going to be on the 17th. The main course is going to be on the 18th. I hope I'm getting the dates right. That's uh, right. The main course is on the 18th. And, you know, for the fellows, we, we are, we're fortunate enough to have support from the companies. Therefore, uh, we'll have grant, grant money to be able to provide transport for you guys to be able to come and spend the day with us. Well, we plan on having case-based discussion, which is, which is going to be the best way to learn. And the case-based discussion is going to allow you to participate with the attendings in the course. Our faculty is a worldwide faculty. We're having two live cases from Germany, two live cases from Kingsport, Tennessee, and four live cases from Mount Sinai. So I think it's an incredible opportunity in two short days to learn a lot of peripheral arterial disease from a people who do it and people who understand the disease process and, and how to work in a multidisciplinary manner. Again, I, I thank you so much for your time, and we'll see you next, next month. Thanks, Dr. Karthik. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Krishnan, for the wonderful case. Uh, thank you, everyone, for joining us. We'll see you again next month, uh, same time, 8 o'clock in the morning. 
um, Eastern Standard Time at uh, on April 22nd for the next live case. Um, and join us. Uh, we'll take any questions from you at info at peripheralinterventions.org. Please do email us. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Doctor.